Good evening and welcome to Overpriced Coffee at the Movies. My name is David Sherez Vitella and on this episode, Uncut Gems. Listening to a podcast, I found out about a docuseries Netflix had produced about Maradona. There are a couple of important things you have to know to understand what's happening. Number one, the way soccer works in most countries is not the way most sports work in the United States. In soccer, there are multiple leagues, the top league and the second tier league. The team in the top league with the lowest points at the end of a season gets knocked down to the second tier league. The team from the second tier league that wins their tournament goes up to the main league. Because Mexico likes to complicate things, they have two tournaments per year, but only one team goes up and one team goes down each year. So if you're in the second tier and you win the first tournament, you either have to win the second tournament to go up, or after the second tournament, you go up against the team that won the second tournament. Then the winner goes up, unless there's a weird confusing rule that won't allow a major team to go down to the second tier league. It's confusing, it's dumb, and there are a lot of dumb loopholes. Number two, Maradona has had a long and troubled history with drugs and he was being hired by a team in the second tier league to help them climb to the main league. That team happens to be in the drug capital of Mexico. Diego Maradona is a very interesting soccer player, former I suppose. He's retired now, but even though he's retired, he's often in the tabloids. Diego makes me think of Mar from Sin City, a barbarian boozing and self-medicating. If you don't know who Diego Maradona is, he's an Argentinian soccer player often considered the best, or at least in the conversation, for best soccer player ever. Typically, it's between him and Pelé. Most in the world think it's Pelé, but people in Argentina believe it's Diego. And it's kind of like a Germany in World War II type of deal, meaning that it's a relatively small country going against the whole world, but they somehow managed to make a lot of noise and cause a lot of commotion. Since retiring, Diego coached the Argentinian national team during a World Cup, and it did not go well. He's also been in and out of rehab for cocaine and if I remember correctly, alcohol. He's also managed to gain a lot of weight and being how most parts of the world are in the SPC as the US of A, it's become a source of ridicule. He's been seen stumbling out of restaurants and soccer stadiums. He's been incoherent in interviews, causing many to speculate that he's back on drugs, which he typically denies. As far as I know, Maradona is loved in Argentina. There might be a group of people who don't want to be associated with him, but they aren't as vocal. On that note, everyone else around the world that doesn't like Maradona is not shy to let you know. They make it seem like whatever goodwill he once had has worn off. Maradona has become one of those people that people watch hoping they fail. Similar to Kanye West, also because of his ego, I don't think Maradona has called himself a god the way Kanye has, but people in Argentina have established a church on his behalf. Diego Maradona was asked to coach Los Dorados de Sinaloa, a team that was in the lowest position of the league, one that didn't even have a complete stadium. According to the docuseries, people were puzzled. They seemed to think that that symbolized that his career was at an all-time low. By people, I am referring to a couple of radio hosts that make occasional appearances to provide analysis and context. The radio hosts speculate that his stay in Sinaloa will be disastrous. They believe he will either drink or go back to doing drugs. Maradona gets to Sinaloa and is tasked with rebuilding a team. The team director seem to believe that it's on them to rebuild Maradona and it becomes a symbiotic relationship. Maradona trying to get the team to the top league and the team trying to maintain Maradona clean and return him to his glory. Selfishly, in a way, the team director wants to be the person that brings back Maradona. Maradona is not in great shape. He's gained a lot of weight and he has knee problems. Years of drug use have made him almost incoherent. He's temperamental, so much so that he's often kicked out of the field. Whenever he's being kicked out, the opposing team mocks him which makes him even angrier. He trashes his own locker room, but when he's in a good mood, he's abnormally happy. He dances with the players, he's kind to the press, he goes out to dinner with the team and spends time with his much younger girlfriend. Little by little, it seems like the team is growing, they are winning, they make it to the kickoff rounds. 
and then they lose the first of the two tournaments. Maradona goes back to Argentina. He's supposed to return before the second tournament starts, and he doesn't. He's in the hospital, supposedly because of his knees, but his much younger girlfriend broke up with him, and some people, newscasters and the radio host, though not directly, imply that he's actually in rehab for drugs. Maybe Netflix was trying to protect his image, or maybe he wasn't in rehab for drugs, but it's never clear. Either way, the season has started, the team is losing, the field is in terrible shape, and Maradona has not returned. When Maradona finally shows up, the team needs to win their remaining games just to possibly qualify to the knockout rounds. Some people, the radio host, think that it's too late to do anything, but if anyone could make it happen, it's Maradona. Somehow, Maradona pulls it off. He gets his team to the knockout rounds and then once again to the finals. If Maradona pulls it off, the team might just advance to the top league. They just have to win the tournament and beat the previous champs. The way soccer finals in the Mexican leagues work is that they play two games, one in each of the team's home stadium. The points carry over from one game to the next. The total is what matters. Say you win the first game 3-1 but lose the second game 1-2. to two. Well, the overall score is 4-3. to three. So your team wins. Unless for some reason a point is worth more for some weird reason. So, Maradona's team is in the final and they have a lot to prove. It's a team that was in last place and it's a man that presumably was at rock bottom before the team. They are facing the same team as the previous time. The previous time when Maradona's team lost, the opposing team started chanting something against Maradona. I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was probably phallic and probably homophobic. And Maradona is still angry about that. He wants to shut up the crowd. I'm watching this series trying to remember whether or not Dorados de Sinaloa is in the top league, and I cannot remember. Mexican soccer is weird. Teams have won, but didn't have the funds to be in the top league. So the team that's descending to the second tier league buys the team that's meant to go up, changes the name, changes the location, and everything remains the same. I played the final episode of the series completely invested, wondering whether or not gambling on Maradona will pay off. Will he deliver? Will he crack under pressure? Goals and near goals and reaction shots. The opposing team's crowd chanting offensive things directed at Maradona. Maradona gets angry. Will he get kicked out? Or will he keep his cool? And I've never been so invested on a soccer game. Never before had I rooted for Maradona, but on this particular occasion, I hope that he wins. Because, well, after so many setbacks, he deserves it. I mean... That's what made Rocky such a compelling story. But that's just that. Rocky was just a story. In stories, the protagonist wins. Even if just for a moment. Later in the week, I go watch Uncut Gems. When I go buy the tickets, there's a young couple in front of me. The girl is wearing cat ears. I find that strange, but assume it's an Ariana Grande thing. She's attractive in the most conventional way. He's wearing clothes that make me think that he plays FIFA on Xbox on his free time. She doesn't speak much Spanish and the boyfriend has a bit of an accent. She's asking him to teach her a few phrases because she's going to need them if she gets the promotion. She says she's going to work New Year's. Then she jokes. I'm going to start the year the same way I ended. Broke and working. The boyfriend fake laughs and I realize that a part of you dies when you date someone whose main qualities are physical. He teaches her how to say hasta la vista, baby. She tries to say it, but can't. She asks what it means, and he says it means see you later. I'm reminded of a time an older gentleman said that to an older lady in a flirtatious way, and the older lady blushed. I couldn't believe it had worked, and now I couldn't believe this girl had never heard that line. I realized they were much younger than I assumed. How young do you have to be for Terminator not to be common knowledge? They get a couple of tickets for cats, which explains the cat ears. And once again, I realize that part of you dies when you date someone whose main attributes are physical. But at the same time, I don't condemn him. When you're young, you're allowed to be shallow. You're allowed to be shallow because you haven't done a deep dive into yourself. 
So you haven't really figured out what's important to you. And that's what dating in your 20s is like. It's a late screening. I haven't watched reviews or trailers, but I have heard people say that the movie caused them a lot of anxiety. But I've just watched Maradona's Netflix documentary, and it has similar beats and themes. Maybe I shouldn't have watched it right before watching Uncut Gems because suddenly Uncut Gems seemed so benign in comparison to Maradona in Mexico. Here was a story about a fuck up that gambles at all, but it didn't compare to the story of a real life fuck up that gambles at all. The stakes of a basketball game to serve a fictional story didn't compare to the stakes of a soccer game that affected a real life person. To top it off, Adam Sandler's character reminded me of people I know that I wish I didn't. Two stars. Rewatch, doubtful.